Hi there, and welcome to the Explaining History podcast. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Red Army during the Russian Civil War. And I think one of the things that's um, worth talking about here are some of the, the kind of the ebbs and flows of um, Bolshevik thinking um, about military force and the particular factions that exist within the Bolshevik party. Um, because really, until the kind of the ban on factionalism um, that Lenin institutes at the end of the Civil War uh, in 1921, and um, the um, real kind of consolidation of decision making within the Politburo, there are a, a number of voices within um, the the Bolshevik Party um, and a range of different opinions on things. So, uh, from following the uh, October Revolution in um, 1917, for a period of time after that, the new um, Bolshevik regime is very poorly defended indeed. It has, um, for the next six months, three um, regiments of Latvian rifles um, and the Kronstadt sailors. And this, uh, the Latvian rifles... Um, number uh, about uh, 35,000 men. And then you have the, the Kronstadt sailors as well. Um, so this an army does not make. And you have, obviously, um, a, a number of um, well-armed uh, and well-equipped, well-supplied uh, rivals developing um, in the guise of the, the, the white armies on the periphery of Bolshevik-held territory. The myth version, the fantasy version that um, the, the Bolsheviks created for themselves after the Civil War was that their new army developed from the Red Guards, that these were um, good proletarian types who were uh, motivated, commis- committed and passionate uh, politicised ideological warriors who were there to defend the revolution. And this is not the case at all. The Red Guards in 1917 are um, workers. Um, They are groups of workers and soldiers, uh, many soldiers who uh, mutinied, um, workers who have um, left the shop floor and are really roaming the streets of Petrograd um, and other major cities looking for some kind of class revenge, some kind of payback, um, committing various acts of um, largely unsolicited uh, violence. They These are not guys who are in the employ of the Cheka during the, the Red Terror. Um, they are a uh, vigilante militia. They are um, working under their, to their own devices very often and uh, committing acts of terror against the uh, now dispossessed bourgeoisie and really robbing, raping and looting um, a lot of the time. These are not the the kind of people who are going to defend the revolution uh, on the battlefield and the priority for the Bolshevik regime is to get workers back into the factories as the civil war begins to develop. You don't want uh, skilled machinists or people who can work a blast furnace wandering around the streets with a rifle. You need to get them back doing what they're doing. So they're they're pretty useless, really, and uh, when Red Guards are put into the field, are consistently routed. Trotsky himself has little time for the Red Guards. Um, He is made the Commissar for Military Affairs and looks upon them as uh, an ill-disciplined rabble. Uh, This is not the kind of workers' army that he had uh, had hoped for. There are other voices on the left of the Bolsheviks that um, believe that it's, it's questionable whether you need an army at all. Now, this sounds to our ears at the height of a civil war, um, with um, the negotiations to exit um, Russia from the First World War not yet concluded, and so with um, German uh, forces uh, on Russian soil, this seems kind of patently absurd. But the thinking is something like this. Many of the Bolsheviks who had, se- who had seized power with Lenin in 1918, 1917, I beg your pardon, had long histories um, as members of the kind of the underground radical intelligentsia 
is throughout the last couple of decades of being arrested, being put in exile, and normally being manhandled by peasant soldiers. To them, the Tsar's army, and all armies really, were um, symbols of class oppression. Armies to the Bolsheviks are used for two things. Firstly, internal repression, you know, cracking down on to prevent revolution. And secondly, to wage imperialist wars, to throw, you know, the working classes as cannon fodder at one another so that the bourgeoisie can uh, uh, take new territories, colonies, and, you know, take their share of the profits, that kind of thing. So the, the question begs itself... Uh, from the Bolshevik mindset, what do we need this institution for at all? Um, once the oppressive Tsarist state has gone away and Soviet democracy has sprung up, then surely we won't need an army to enforce an anything at all. Um, there might be some sort of you know revolutionary people's militia to defend the revolution, that kind of thing. But um, this this whole army business, uh, perhaps we won't need. This idea is swiftly dispelled and disabused um, as, as the realities of the civil war uh, present themselves. If anything, um, Trotsky uh, looks directly to the example of the Tsar's army to get um, inspiration and ideas. He's very much uh, not reinventing the wheel kind of guy on this topic. Trotsky's interesting because Trotsky's um, entire life up to the Russian Civil War had never featured any sort of formal military training at all. He knew nothing of tactics, logistics, uh, strategy, um, and yet he makes a formidable uh, military leader during the Civil War. Um, so, despite his many failings, he seemed to be pretty damn good at that. From mid-1917 onwards, during the, the last summer offensive that uh, the provisional government launched against the Germans, the um, former Tsarist army had been melting away. When talk of um, land reform and land seizure was heard uh, in the ranks, um, soldiers who were really peasants in greatcoats began to desert and to go back to their villages to take part in this um, historically unprecedented and probably once in a lifetime process of seizing land from the, the landowners. Um, the, this leaves really the uh, successor state to the provisional government, the uh, Soviet government, with very little to, to fight with. And unfortunately for the uh, the soldiers that are, are left, and really we're talking about the Red Guards here, Trotsky um, wants to kind of get rid of some of the more inconvenient aspects of the revolution as far as he, a military commander, is concerned. So what Trotsky does is he, he says to the army regiments, um, the spirit of kind of the committee um, within the regiment that's gone we are no longer going to be having a revolutionary democracy while we fight the white armies so uh, much of the um, Soviet democracy that had developed within army regiments particularly during the February revolutions and then throughout 1917 um, is, is abolished Instead, formal discipline is uh, reintroduced, saluting, for example, um, the appointment of um, a proper professionalised officer corps um, and a hierarchy. Um, and this was you know, very unpopular. Again, um, there were already, even before they are compelled to do so, some 8,000 former Tsarist officers actually would come to the Bolsheviks and volunteer to join the Red Army, um, perhaps for a number of reasons. Um, these are men who, uh, soldiering is what they know. Um, they were perhaps um, content for a career in the army, irrespective of their uh, political uh, political masters, and um, they were um, some, particularly like Alexei Brusilov, who had been 
the um, general adjutant of the uh, southern southwest um, sector during the First World War and therefore fighting the Carpathian Offensive, which is also known as the Brusilov Offensive, the most successful uh, Russian offensive of the First World War. Um, he chose to join the Bolsheviks, to join the Red Army as a general, because he believed that if the um, Soviets um, were the, if this was the will of the people to um, embrace communism, and who was he to stand in the way of what Russia wanted? He himself was uh, far from uh, having any communist ideas and was essentially a victim of the communists. So at the same time that um, the, the rest of the um, uh, bourgeoisie and the upper classes were subject to the Red Terror of 1918, you actually have some army officers who are uh, certainly from that class background uh, joining the army to serve the Bolsheviks. Uh, Trotsky, on the 30th of September 1918, uh, passes um, the, what he calls the Special Order, um, which says that if the um, officers uh, turn, to be, turn out to be turncoats, turn to be traitors, then their, their families will, can be imprisoned and executed. Uh, by the end of the Civil War, there's 75,000 uh, former Tsarist army officers in the Red Army. So that really does show um, how successful Trotsky was in recruiting them. They're offered um, superior pay to ordinary men. Um, they are um, for respected. Um, they are followed around by political commissars half the time, um, but they, their ranks are, are restored. And um, Trotsky accepts that this is one of the kind of the compromises of the revolution, that you can you can have uh, an attempt to create an egalitarian society, but when that that attempt is threatened externally, you actually need to have a hierarchical system in place in order to defend it. Um, and it's something that can perhaps be dealt with at a later date. But you need to keep the revolution actually actually going in order to be able to do this. Trotsky does manage to um, paint something of a target on his own back as well. Um, the problem that he has at this time is that he is not popular within the party and that um, a lot of his um, uh, enemies uh, look very closely at the military successes or lack thereof of the Red Army. All of a sudden, articles criticising Trotsky start to appear in Pravda, um, and the measure, the, the step of taking uh, czarist officers and putting them in the army comes under immense scrutiny. The summer of 1918 is full of setbacks, um, and whenever you have instances of Red Army, uh, former czarist officers uh, retreating, or in one case, actually mutinying, it's blamed on Trotsky and um, the uh, uh, voices within the party that say that you know some sort of revolutionary people's militia should be created and instead of having um, well uh, well studied military tactics and a kind of a hierarchy of an officer corps, we simply rely on kind of a, a revolutionary people's war and allow the you know the passion that people have to defend the revolution to spur them on. Um, the this abandon, the abandonment of this is is obviously being some kind of folly. Now Trotsky has a particular thorn in his side um, on the uh, from uh, Clement Voroshilov, who was a Red Guard commander later to become one of Stalin's most uh, prized ministers, commissars, um, and he becomes a voice in what is known as the military opposition. The military opposition are army officers, normally working class ones, who resent the arrival of the uh, former czarists uh, into the army, um, and they uh, oppose what Trotsky has been doing. Voroshilov has the ear of Stalin, who is the uh, Commissar for Nationalities and, you know, one of the uh, more important growing, during the Civil War, one of the growing um, voices within the, uh, the Politburo. Um, and he is able to openly defy Trotsky with Stalin's backing. 
um, the tension over this issue, uh, over the backing of Voroshilov, is one of the kind of the seeds of this kind of poisonous enmity between the two men um, uh, in, into the future. Um, if you go way back into the uh, Explaining History archive, there's a whole thing I, I did on um, Trotsky and Stalin. Um, well worth a listen, uh, if I do say so myself. Um, so, for every um, inspired piece of leadership that Trotsky gave um, as um, Commissar for Military Affairs, he also um, created a great deal of animosity towards himself, um, partly due to his general arrogance and egotism, and also due to um, his Jewish origins. There is, of course, uh, an immense amount of latent and not so latent anti Semitism in Russia, uh, particularly during the revolutionary period. And he um, is seen as perhaps the kind of the, the more noticeable, identifiable, um, dare we even say glamorous figure of, of the revolution. Um, he is w uh, very well catered for on his mobile um, command centre, uh, which is uh, pulled by train across Russia. Um, he is very well turned out in sort of um, immaculate uniform, um, and the um, ability of Trotsky to generate resentment towards himself is really kind of a key feature of his career. What he does do is he is able to propagandise effectively towards Russia's peasants. And when the Red Army, as we'll talk about in a moment, expands into um, a mass force of over three million men, this is crucial to the winning of the war. The, uh, the Red Army, um, uh, and under Trotsky, uh, definitely wins a propaganda war. The white armies, the former czarists um, on the other side who are really trying to turn the clock back on the revolution, um, they are unable to make clear to the peasantry at all what it is that's in it for them. That um, there is, there appears, uh, as far as the peasants go, um, that they are kind of trapped between a rock and a hard place. But um, the Bolsheviks do give the impression, though a false one, that there will be some land at the end of it for them. And also, once the White Armies start to be backed by foreign powers, there is um, no pretense there that they are kind of in any way patriotic, whereas the Bolsheviks can clearly um, make that case about themselves, that they are some sort of patriotic force um, defending Russia, even if you know ideas about patriotism are a complete anathema to them. Um, the uh, decision to call for mass conscription really uh, comes in the summer of 1918 when the revolution is surrounded. You've got the British in the north, you've got the Japanese landing in Siberia, and um, a, a, a whole ring of um, uh, enemy ar enemy Russian armies surrounding uh, the heartlands of, of Russia and the Czechs, uh, the Czech Legion having seized the Trans-Siberian Railway. Um, the uh, key to winning the war is to create this vast steamroller. The Red Army never really fights particularly effectively, but in some battles um, it manages to uh, outnumber the white opponents by, or some, in some battles even 10 to 1, by simply using enormous numbers of men, um, they manage to uh, crush opposition to them. So um, the white generals and, and white soldiers um, outperform in most instances and outfight in most instances the Red Army um, uh, in, in, in most key ways that you can look at it. Establishing conscription is difficult at first because there's no infrastructure in the countryside. The Bolsheviks literally don't have um, any of the uh, bureaucratic um, knowledge needed to actually find to actually be able to carry out conscription um, meaningfully, and so they rely on the new peasant Soviets in villages, and the peasant Soviets are not particularly allied to the goals of the regime. Um, the peasant Soviets are allied to the interests of, of the village. Um, they are, these are the, um, the mere 
um, the peasant commune simply um, in in a new guise, uh, change the name, but you know carry on very much as before. And peasant communes have never been inclined to send the sons of their members away to fight and to send good ploughing horses um, away to drag um, artillery pieces across the countryside. Uh, it's no good for anybody other than the people that want to really kind of uh, exploit and use the peasants. Uh, and, you know, they're, 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 they're wise to this. So it was really a white-owned goal that forces the um, peasants into the arms of the Bolsheviks. Um, had, the Bol had the whites offered some degree of land reform, or had they said that the peasants could keep at least some of the land that they had taken during the revolution... Uh, they may well have won the Civil War. But it, in the spring of 1919, as harvesting season was um, over, and you don't need to have any um, as many men um, on the land anymore, um, and the whites begin to advance, the peasants become fearful that the gains of the revolution are going to be lost. And so they pour into the arms of the Bolsheviks, thus enabling the Bolsheviks really to win the war. There is, however, um, a, 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 another a dimension to this. As the Red Army expands uh, dramatically, uh, the Bolsheviks lack the relevant um, sort of food and infrastructure and um, production systems in, in order to uh, keep an army on the march. And again, they return to the peasants with um, requisitioning and food brigades. Um, as the peasants become increasingly reluctant to hand over their produce, so the policy of war communism uh, has to be instituted. Now, I've talked about war communism before, um, probably about a year and a half ago. Um, if you go to the um, explaininghistory.podhost.com, there's actually a way of searching for podcasts on there. So type in more communism and see what you get. Um, so I won't talk about that now, but it is out there um, and well worth a listen. Um, so the the growth of this, this mass army to win the war really leads to all sorts of kind of social and economic and humanitarian crises later on. And the uh, policy of war communism uh, culminates in the famine in the Volga that kills approximately between five to seven million people. Okay, so I hope that's been useful to you. Um, if you're new to explaining history and you're studying the Russian Revolution or anything like that, there is uh, an ebook out there, um, top ten questions on the uh, Russian Revolution answered. You can find it through the Explaining History website, www.explaininghistory.com, um, and uh, check out there as well there's a whole bunch of stuff um pertaining to russia anyway we just hit forty-five thousand subscribers this week so a big thanks to everybody i'm much obliged um and let's go on from there let's hit the big five oh um and i'll catch you on the next explaining history podcast thank you bye bye